Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inu Zor Education. Um, we continue uh, lectures on theory of probabilities um, within this advanced math for teenagers course. Uh, the course is presented on unizor.com and that's where I suggest you to watch this lecture because it has notes on the side uh, of the video and the notes basically contain the same material which, which I am right now presenting. But what's important is this particular lecture and many others actually are about problem solving which means that um, I would strongly recommend you to start with notes to this lecture and read just the uh, problems. Try to solve them themselves. That's the most important part of it. And to tell you the truth, that's the purpose of the entire course, to teach you how to solve problems. And the only way to teach to solve problems is to solve problems. <laughs> Now, I will show my solutions and obviously um, you can come up with your solutions. Uh, you can send it to me in an email. I'll be more than happy to put it on the website as your solution with your author, authorship, etc. Um, all right, so these are a few easy problems on theory of probabilities. Um, so let's just start. All right. The problem number one is about climate change. Well, actually, it's about climate not changing. Um, let's assume that we have the probability of snow on a Christmas day, 25th of December, so it's a white Christmas, and the probability of this event equals to 0 0.4 doesn't matter how we obtain this number based on whatever theories or statistics or whatever it's given all right the probability is 0 0.4 of snow on Christmas Day on 25th of December now let's assume that climate is not changing and this probability is exactly the same for the next 10 years from now on now I'm interested in the following event What's the probability to have snow on 3 out of 10 years on December 25th? I'm not saying which 3 years out of 10. I'm just saying 3, exactly 3. Now, First of all, we have a freedom of choice. Which tree out of ten uh, is snowing? Which means that, just let's apply our knowledge of combinatorics, it's number of combinations from ten to three. <coughs> we can take the first three years, the, the last three years, the middle three years, or the first, the seventh, and the eighth, I mean, whatever. And the number of these combinations is exactly number of combinations of um, 3 from 10, which is actually 10 times 9 times 8 divided by 1 times 2 times 3. That's the formula for number of combinations, right? Now, let's assume that our combinations 3 um, uh, years out of 10 is chosen. Now, if I have chosen these 3 years, and I know that these 3 years are supposed to be snowing, the probability of this is 0 0.4 in each year. Years are considered to be independent from each other, which means that during these three years, the probability should multiply. So the probability on all three of these years is 0 0.3 in the power of 3. What about the rest of the years, the, the other seven years? Well, the other seven years, it must not snow because I have chosen exactly the three years when it's snowing and then the other seven years are not supposed to snow. The probability of not snowing is obviously 0 0.6, right? If snowing, 0 0.4. So the other seven, each of them has a probability of 0 0.6 of not snowing and there are seven of them. So I have this number of combination of three years out of ten. Now this is the probability that the snow will 
um, go on uh, these three years and this is the probability of not snowing on these three years and I have to multiply them together to get the total probability of some three years be snowing on, this, on, on, on December 25th and some others not. So the product of these, which is um, C10 3 times 0 0.4, 3 times 0 0.67, this is the answer to the problem. That's the probability to have snow on uh, December 25th on some three years out of ten. That's it. Now, what was important in this problem? Well, we actually made three decisions here. Number one decision was we had to choose which three years out of ten. Years are exactly the same, so if I'm saying on any three years it's to be snowing, it means I have to choose which ones, and that's why I have to have this combination of uh, 3 out of 10. Now then, when my uh, three years are chosen, no matter what they are, for instance the first three years, the probability of snowing on each of them is 0 0.4, and events are independent year from year, and that's why we uh, multiply the probability. So the snowing 0 0.4, not snowing 0 0.6, and they have to multiply three of these and seven of those. Okay, next. Next is more formal, not really related to any kind of a natural phenomenon. I have a variable, a random variable, C, which takes value 1, 2, 1 fourth, 1 8, 1 2 to the power of n, etc. So it can take an infinite but countable number of values. Is it possible? Of course it is possible. The only thing is I have to take the probability of this to be equal to something obviously not constant because the sum of these is supposed to be equal to 1, right? So I have chosen this probability. So the probability of my random variable C to take the value 1 half is 1 half. The probability to take 1 fourth is 1 fourth. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm basically the author of the problem. I can do whatever I want as long as the problem is correct. Now, is it correct? Let's just think about it. Is it possible that random variable takes um, these values? Yes. In mathematics, infinity exists. This is the countable in infinity. And I can actually demonstrate geometrically how it can be done. Let's say you have a square, which has an area of 1 of something. I divide it by half. Then I divided the half of this by half and then the half of this by half, half of this by half, etc, etc, and I'm going so smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So this is one half, this is one quarter, this is one eighth, this is one sixteenth, this is one thirty seconds, one sixty fourth, one, one, one over one twenty eight, etc, etc. Now, the area of these um, rectangles, the areas of these rectangles are exactly these numbers if I, I'm continuing this uh, to infinity. And if I drop a point randomly inside of this square, the probability to get into this piece, which is, has an area of one half, the probability is one half, right? If the whole thing is one, this is half of this, so the probability is one half. So that's exactly the model of this particular problem. Now I have a few questions about this. Well, the question number one, is it a correct problem from the theory of probability standpoint? Uh, which means uh, if I will add up all the different probabilities for all the different elementary events, will I get one? 
So if I will add all the probabilities, will I get one? Let's put it S equals to infinite. Well, this is a geometric progression with the first member one half. The factor, when it's diminishing actually, the factor is also one half. And I know how to calculate this geometric, how to calculate the sum of this geometric uh, progression. Now, um, obviously, you know, I don't like the formulas which somebody is supposed to remember, but I do remember the geometric progression when you do, would like to, to, to summarize. The very easy way is to multiply it by the factor. So S times one half equals to one fourth, one eighth, etc. And if I will subtract them, obviously all these will cancel each other and I will have S minus S divided by 2 equals to 1 half, right? Uh, which means 2s minus s equals to 1, which means s is equal to 1. So everything is fine. My sum of all the probabilities is equal to 1, which means the problem is basically correctly stated. So I have certain number of values, I have certain number of probabilities of these values, sum of all probabilities adds up to 1, which is good. Next problem. Next problem is, I would like to know the probability of my random variable to take values between 2 to the power of m and 2 to the power of n assuming that m is uh, well m is let, let's say m is less than n but then I suppose to uh, basically put it in reverse right because it's diminishing right so if m is less than n then 1 over 2 to the power of m is greater than my variable and this is greater than 2 to the power of m. Alright, so how to calculate the probability of my random variable between, to be between these two values? Well, um, basically considering these values are completely unrelated to each other, these are elementary events, right? So. And this is just an event which can be represented as sum of uh, events which are in between these two. Which means I just have to add the probabilities for each elementary event which constitutes this particular inequality. So I have to add the probability of C is equal to 1 to the power of M plus probability of my variable taking 2 to the power m plus 1 etc plus and the last one would be probability of my variable equals 2 to the power of n right so i have to just summarize these probabilities of elementary events which constitute this big event i know the probability of each of them right it's basically It's 1 over 2 to the power of m plus 1 to the power of 2m plus 1, etc. to the power of m. The probability of each uh, value is equal to the value itself, as we were stating in the condition of the problem, right? So, how can I calculate this? Let's do exactly the same thing. I don't remember the formula, obviously, as, as, as I said many times. I will multiply it by one half, and I will get this. 1 over 2 to the power of m uh, multiplied by one half would be 1 uh, over 2 to the power m plus 1, etc. Now, I will have this, and I will have this, right? 
So this would be from the previous member, and to the power of n will give me to the power of n plus 1. Now, if I will subtract, all these would go out. So I will have s minus s over 2, which is s over 2, equals this remains and this remains. 1 over 2 to the power of m minus 1 to the power of 2n plus 1. Now I have to multiply by 2 to get s. It would be this. That's the answer, right? If I will multiply by 2, I will reduce by 1 this and reduce by 1 this. Now, is it the correct formula? Well, let's just think about it. If my m is equal to 1, which means I'm starting from the very beginning, and my n is equal to infinity, which means I don't have anything at the end. So I'm basically summarizing the whole thing. I should have 1, right? Do I have 1? If m is equal to 1, m minus 1 is 0, 1 over 2 to the power of 0, that's 1. n is infinity, which means it goes to 0. So that's true. Now, what if m is equal to 1 and n is equal to, let's say, 2? Which means I'm adding up the first and the second members only. Um, so I'm supposed to get 1 half plus 1 fourth, which is what? 3 quarters, right? Well, let's just see. If m is equal to 1, that's 1. Because this is 2 to the power of 0. Minus... 1 over 2 to the power of 2, which is 1 quarter. 1 minus 1 quarter, it's 3 quarters. Exactly what we're supposed to do. So this is just a checking. I do re recommend you, whenever you get some formula or some, some result, try to check it in elementary cases like this. Always helps. Now, the third problem related to this particular um, To this particular random variable is what is the expectation what is expected value of my random variable now in expected variable expected value of the random variable is basically a sum of value which it takes down times the probability plus another value times another probability etc so if i will summarize all values weighted with their probabilities, I will get the, um, the ex expected value, or mathematical expectation, or average, if you wish. All right, so that's the definition of the expectation. Now, in this particular case, what does it mean? Well, we know that our random variable takes value one half with a probability one half, one quarter with probability one quarter, etc which means in this particular case it's equal to one half times one half plus one quarter times one quarter plus one eighth times one eighth plus etc one to the power of two n times one to the power of two n plus etc now what is this one quarter one sixteenth one sixty fourth etc one to the power of 2n, etc. It's also a geometric progression. The first member is one quarter, and the factor is one quarter, right? So, what I will do, I will multiply it by one quarter, and I will get what? One quarter times one quarter is one sixteenth, one sixteenth times one quarter will be one sixty-fourth, etc., to infinity. So if I will subtract, all these guys oops, will cancel out. And I have s minus uh, s over 4 is equal to 1 fourth. So this is 3 quarters of s is equal to 1 quarter from which s is equal to multiply by 4, it's 3s is 1, so s is 1 third. So the average value of this random variable, the expectation, is equal to 1 third. That was the last 
um, part of this problem. That's it. And I have the very last problem for this lecture, which is as following. Okay, um, let's assume you're trying to dial a number, a phone number. It's a number of your friend, but you forgot the last digit. So you remember everything else, but not the last digit. Well, you don't remember it, which means you can try. There are only 10 different digits, which you can try, which means you can definitely succeed in no more than 10 attempts, right? So, um, now my question is, what is the probability to succeed uh, in no more than, let's say, n attempts? Where n is some number from 1 to 10, right? Now, what's the probability to uh, to hit the right number on the first attempt? Well, obviously one tenth, right? Because you have 10 different digits, you, ex you, you just randomly choose any one of them, and the probability obviously is one tenth that you get the right number. All right, so the probability in, in case your number of attempts, let's put it k, is equal to one, is one tenth. Okay, now what's the probability of hitting your right number on the second try. Well, it means that the first time you try, you are wrong, and the probability of this is 9 tenths, right? Because there are nine wrong numbers, and you choose one of them, so the probability is 9 tenths. Then, the next try, you obviously don't try the same which you already tried, so you have only nine different choices from the remaining numbers, remaining digits which you didn't really yet dial. And let's assume that you have succeeded. This is number of attempts is equal to two, which means out of the remaining nine numbers, you hit the right one, and the probability is one ninth. And the result is nine is canceling, it's one tenth again. What's the probability to be successful on the third trial? Well, it means the first trial will be unsuccessful. Now remains nine wrong, uh, nine numbers out of them is only one right, and eight wrong. And you made a second attempt, and you made a wrong choice, which means out of nine, eight are wrong, so the probability is eight nines. And then on the third attempt, when you have only eight remaining numbers, you hit the right number and the probability is one eighth, right? One tenth again. As you understand, obviously, the probability will always be equal to one tenth of succeeding on the fourth, the fifth, etc., etc., including the tenths. So the probability to be successful on um, nth uh, try is uh, one tenth, and the probability to be successful on um, any number of tries not exceeding n, so from one to n, would be obviously n divided by ten, because it contains one, two, three, etc., up to n. Each one of them has one tenth the probability, and we just add them up together. Well, that's the last problem. Um, I do recommend you to go through these problems yourself right now. Use the notes on unizor.com. Um, and that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.